Goldwood presents My One Month Marriage Written by Shari Lowe and read by Kathleen McCarran The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. The Worlds of the One Month Marriage Zoe's World Zoe Danton, 33 Strong, driven partner in the cutting-edge marketing company, the Bee Agency, spent the previous Christmas being dumped by the love of her life. Tom Butler, Zoe's business partner, present tense, and the man who broke her heart, past tense. Chrissy Harrison, Tom's childhood sweetheart and mother of his 12-year-old son, Ben. Roger Kemp, hotel chain owner and client of the Bee Agency, Married to Felice, a model who last smiled sometime in the 90s. Verity's World Verity Danton, 34. Zoe's sister, an exercise-obsessed primary school teacher who works with kids and doesn't even pretend to like grown-ups. Ned Merton, Verity's colleague, friend and the object of her affections. She just hasn't told him yet. Evie's World Evie Danton, 31, a nurse on the geriatric ward of Glasgow Central Hospital, funny, kind, caring, and the best friend that everyone should have in times of fun and crisis. Charge nurse Kay Gorman, Evie's best mate in and out of work, a single parent, raising her son Chester, six. Dr Seth McGonagall, socially awkward and perfectly formed orthopaedic surgeon, Married to the head of cardiology. Carlo Moretti, Evie's friend and waiter in the whole Danton family's favourite Italian restaurant, owned by his father, Gino. Marina's World. Marina Danton Smythe, 35. Zoe's eldest sister, a wealthy helicopter mum who runs her family's lives with military precision. Graham Smythe, Marina's husband of 13 years, a wealthy banker who has somewhere along the years changed from being her dashing alpha male to a workaholic bore. Oscar and Annabelle Danton Smythe, 12, Marina's phone-obsessed twins. The world they grew up in. Marge Danton Walton Morrison, Marina Verity Zoe and Evie's mum, now in her third husband, Derek, and it already looks like he's going to have as much marital success as their father, Will, divorced in 1999, and Marge's second husband, Gregor, divorced 2008. Will Danton, Marge's first husband and father of the Danton sisters. Chapter 1. The Four Sisters. Present day, Sunday, 2pm. I'm in one of those unofficial clubs that no one really wants to be in. You know, like the Association of People Who Got Jilted at the Altar, or the Secret Society of Dumplings who let online scammers empty their bank account because they believed they had a long-lost uncle who left them millions in his will. In this case, I'm Zoe Danton, the latest fully paid-up member of the collective of fools who had marriages that lasted for less time than a four-part miniseries. A month. Thirty days, to be precise. It's not even as if I have the folly of youth as an excuse. Thirty-three years on this planet is long enough to learn some vital life lessons. For healthy oral hygiene, always floss morning and night. If it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. If you get caught in a riptide, swim parallel to the shore. Potpourri has no purpose. And if you're getting married, ensure that it'll last longer than the flowers you carried up the aisle. Otherwise, you'll be me, the idiot who is sitting on her wide plank oak floor, consumed by fear that the local newspaper will use my story as a human interest feature, surrounded by gifts that I need to return. Except the cocktail shaker. That one's already open and in use. Do you feel like an idiot? Verity asks handing me a drink that's so pink it could very well be radioactive. 
She was the first member of the Sister Emergency Service to respond to my text and rush over to my city centre Glasgow flat. I hope she kicked the bin bags containing the last of my short-lived husband's things on the way into our marital home. Actually, marital home is a stretch. It's my flat, a one-bedroom waterfront apartment in an 80s block on the city side of the Clyde. And even though he's lived with me for the last year or so, I realise now that I always felt like he was just visiting. Maybe that should have been a hint. So, to answer Verity's question, did I feel like an idiot? No, I lie, only to be met with her raised eyebrow of cynicism. I capitulate like an eight-year-old caught spray-painting the school toilet walls. <sighs> okay, of course I do. I mean, even Kim Kardashian's shortest marriage lasted 72 days. It's a sad day when I make worse life choices than a reality show star who built her career on the size of her arse. I take a sip of, what is this? I ask, when my taste buds throw their hands up at a loss as to what they're faced with. Verity shakes her head, her deep red ponytail swinging as she does so. Even on a Sunday morning, in the midst of this traumatic episode in our family's history, she still looks great. My elder sister has been on this earth for 14 months longer than me, and something happened in those 14 months that gave her a level of physical superiority that the rest of us could only aspire to. She's one of those women who has visible cheekbones and naturally fiery, thick, long red hair, so you could pretty much put her through a car wash and she'd come out the other end, sweep her hair up in a messy bun and look fabulous. Even more annoying, she has absolutely no awareness of this. Her appearance and personality are the complete opposite of each other. On the outside, fierce, bold, striking. On the inside, restrained and the most conservative of us all. Now she is shrugging. No idea. I just put a bit of everything in the fridge into the cocktail shaker. There's gin, cream, raspberry juice, pineapple. I don't have pineapple juice, I interrupt. Verity doesn't break stride. Crushed pineapple from a tin. You'll find it lurking at the bottom of the glass. Vitamin C has so many benefits. Will it prevent me marrying dickheads in the future? She glides right over that. No, but it does help with absorption of iron, decreasing blood pressure, combating heart disease, and off she goes into full education mode. This is what happens when one of your three sisters is a primary school teacher. Not only is she relentlessly organised and can calm a class of stroppy eight-year-olds with some kind of Jedi mind trick, but she has a remarkable memory for facts and an absolutely pitch-perfect technique for delivering them. Unfortunately, in this case, her pupil has zoned out. What does it matter what is in there? As long as it contains alcohol that will reduce my feelings of general crapness by even one degree, I'm game. There's a crash at the door. What have I missed? Evie wails as she enters the room, balancing several plastic bags and a tray giving off a distinctly lasagna aroma on her forearms. I swallow a slither of pineapple. Just some rampant self-pity, wails of regret and general pathetic wallowing. My younger sister nods thoughtfully. I'll just as expect it then. Will Lasagna help? Jean, one of the clears on the ward, made it. She says it's her ancient traditional family recipe, but she's from Paisley, has no Italian descendants and has never been further than the Great Yarmouth on her holidays, so I have my doubts. In saying that, I'm starting the diet tomorrow, so no point letting this go to waste. Dropping the bags on the floor, she wanders out in the direction of the kitchen, clutching the lasagna, the stiff blue trousers of her nursing uniform rustling as she goes. The youngest of the four of us, Evie, is a nurse on a geriatric ward at Glasgow Central Hospital. When I'm in my dotage, there's no one else I want to look after me although I'm hoping that she'll tend to my every need on the 14th deck of a cruise ship floating around the Caribbean, rather than in an ageing Victorian building on the edge of the city centre with a bird's-eye view of the nearby motorway. Still, she loves her job, and nursing is what she's always wanted to do, 
Even when we were kids, she got an undeniable thrill when one of us needed emergency first aid. I hear the sound of the oven door banging shut before she re-enters with a glass of radiation pink. I took some of this from the cocktail shaker, she informs us. It looks suspiciously like something I'd prescribe for acid reflux. Right, what's the latest? Married anyone else since I saw you yesterday? Divorced yet? Engaged again? I refuse to rise to her innocent face sarcasm, instead going for dry threats and indignation. If you carry on like that, I'm going into work. It's Sunday, Verity points out, always one to insert facts into the equation. And I hate to point out that your job was at the root of this whole debacle in the first place, Evie adds, following it up with, Jesus, my brass straps are killing me. Did I mention I'm going back on the diet tomorrow? You did. Is it the same one as last week? And the week before? Ferrity teases. Not sure, but right now I'm hoping I lose nine and a half stone of smug older sister. Evie fires back. She takes no cheek from anyone, and I love her for it. I thought you were embracing your curves, I inquire, confused. That was last week. This week, I want to book a holiday, wear a bikini, and I've realised that to feel good about that, I'll need to lose the equivalent of a small dinghy in weight in a month and a half, starting right after that lasagna. I don't argue. Only a fool would get in between Evie and her ever-changing body confidence issues. Anyway, I preferred it when we were revelling in your disaster of a life, she tells me. Where were we? Where were we? It's like an echo, only said in a voice that is sharper than the other three in my living room. Marina, only her head and neck visible round the side of the door, is the oldest of the four of us and the designated grown-up. She's the kind of woman who makes lists, has a pension plan, and knows the difference between a vintage bottle of plonk and something off the shelf at Lidl. Evie has just pointed out that my job was to blame for all of this. Yes, well, she's not wrong, at least at the start. Although, to be fair, you did take an unfortunate situation, handle it badly, then let it descend into a complete roaring balls up. Marina concurs before her head and shoulders disappear and I hear the sound of her clicking heels fading as she heads down the hall to the kitchen. I'd bet my last pound that she's carrying a bag containing sushi and hummus. She considers healthy food to be the only option, even in a crisis. Evie gestures to the door. See? Even Her Highness agrees. I finally feel validated as an adult. I ignore the playful barb. Successfully negotiating life with three sisters is 50% love, 30% tolerance and 20% dodging the ever-changing dynamics between us. Especially in this case, as they both have a point. My job, first as sales director, then latterly as partner of Glasgow Marketing Company, the B Agency, definitely contributed to my current situation. If I hadn't worked there... I wouldn't have met Tom. I wouldn't have fallen in love. He wouldn't have broken my heart. And then I wouldn't have gone on to screw up my life so colossally that I'm now contemplating eating dodgy lasagna while wondering what I'm going to tell my mother when I return her generous wedding gift of a lavish, smoked glass beaded chandelier. Granted, it is lovely, in a blingy, wear sunglasses because it's so bright it could cause eye damage kind of way, but the fact that I live in a flat with low ceilings transforms it from an ostentatious decorative statement to a concussion risk. But back to the point. Evie and Marina are right. If I worked anywhere else, the civil service, top shop, NASA, then none of this would have happened. And to quote everyone in the entire history of the world who ever messed up, I just wish I could go back in time and change so many things. In fact, right now, I'd settle for just understanding what has happened to my life because there are still so many questions, so many uncertainties. My phone buzzes and I stretch over a ceramic planter in the shape of a pair of wellies. From Auntie Geraldine, she has a picture of Alan Titchmarsh on her kitchen wall, 
to retrieve it from the table beside the sofa. Marina's heels click into the room, and in my peripheral vision I can see that she slides elegantly into the armchair by the window, plate of sushi in hand. The name at the top of the notification makes my anxiety soar. Roger Kemp. Sadly, no relation to anyone who was ever a member of Spandau Bally, or that slightly scary bloke who played Grant Mitchell in EastEnders and now makes documentaries about criminal gangs and serial killers. With a shaking thumb, I swipe open the message. Roger Kemp is a friend and client, the director of a hotel chain that employs our agency for all its marketing needs. After the proverbial hit the fan, I'd asked him for a favour, a slightly underhand, confidentiality breaching, possibly borderline illegal favour. With a bit of luck, the bloke that makes the documentaries about true crime won't find out about it. I'd asked Roger to check on who paid for a room in one of his hotels last weekend, on the night that my husband broke his vows only 30 days after making them. You know, that fairly insignificant one about being faithful in good times and bad. You see, I know it wasn't my husband, because he'd put his credit cards in my handbag that evening, so it must have been someone else. The other woman. The thought forces me to take another swig of the unidentifiable pink cocktail. Anyway, the favour I'd requested of Roger would mean asking someone in his financial team to pull up the credit card records and sharing the sordid details with me. Now I stare in disbelief at the answer. Type right there on the screen of my phone. This didn't come from me, and I'm sorry. The name on the credit card was Ms Danton. Fuck. 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 One for each of the three of my sisters. And yes, I'm aware that I'm not yet in possession of the facts, but right now I don't feel like being balanced and reasonable. The idle chit-chat in the room stops as each of my sisters... Marina, Evie and Verity spot my expression and realise that something is very, very wrong. Marina, always direct in any situation, is the first to react. Oh God, what now? What is it? Without even realising what I'm doing, my gaze goes from one of them to another as I speak. I just need to know, I say my voice low as I struggle not to choke on the words. Which one of you slept with my husband? Chapter 2 Zoe, 18 months before Princess Square, a gorgeous shopping centre on one of the busiest streets in Glasgow, had always been Zoe's favourite place for a pre-festive lunch. On the Friday before the chunky bloke in the red suit and beard was scheduled to arrive, and despite a mighty hangover from the annual work Santa shindig the evening before, she knew, just absolutely knew, that this was going to be her best Christmas ever. Oh yes, it was all going so well. She'd worked her arse off to become sales director at the B Agency, an up-and-coming marketing company that was based in uber-cool city centre offices. She was madly in love with Tom, one of the two founding partners, and the most thoroughly decent, not to mention cute and sexy guy, she'd ever known. Life was great. Actually, it was spectacular. That afternoon, as Tom and Zoe rose in the glass lift of the upmarket luxury shopping and dining emporium, climbing the height of a beautiful cone-shaped ice-white tree that soared from the ground to the fourth floor of the stunning atrium, she was positively oozing happiness. Mistake. Huge mistake. She'd barely sat down in one of her favourite restaurants, when she sensed that something wasn't quite right with the love of her life. Not to come across as gushy nor needy, because she was neither, but she truly felt that's what he was, and for the first time ever she was in a relationship with someone she could actually envisage a future with. 
They'd been best friends and work colleagues for years. A couple for six months. And there was a gift-wrapped key to her home under her tree with his name on it. Looking handsome today, Mr Butler, she told him as the waiter disappeared with their coats and their drinks order. Water for Tom, champagne for her. Okay, so that was a bit gushy, but she was awash with festive joy, so it was allowed. Unfortunately, it also threw up the first sign that something was off. Normally, he'd compliment her right back, but today he said nothing. She let it go. It was Christmas. His grandfather was unwell and in hospital. His estranged father was on his way from Australia and due to arrive later that day. The guy had things on his mind. Oblivious to the juggernaut headed her way, she went on. I've said to my sister that you'll try and make it for Christmas dinner. As always, Marina was hosting the festivities and it was being run with military precision. I know it'll be difficult with your granddad being ill and your family being here, but I'm hoping you'll get a chance to slip away. Or maybe you could bring your parents. I'm dying to meet them and I'll have to do it at some point, so Christmas dinner is as good a time as any. Marina always lays on far too much food anyway. I think she's doing turkey, ham and steak pie this year, so there'll be loads to go round. I was going to pick up a gift for your parents this afternoon so they won't feel left out. I want to make a good impression on your mother. Stepmother. He corrected her. His weary tone was warning number two, but she missed it again. Clearly her emotional radar was sitting in a corner pissed on mulled wine, watching reruns of Elf. Still oblivious, she went on. Of course, stepmother. Anyway, I was thinking we could nip to Vivian Westwood and pick up something nice, maybe earrings for her, and for your dad, Zoe. We need to talk. There it was. The first line of almost every breakup speech in history. Yet still she didn't register the vibe. Must have been getting to the good bit in Elf. Yes, of course, darling. You don't think you'll make it for dinner? It's fine, I understand. I really do. We need to talk about us. This time she paused. Reality finally dawning. Dread swooping right in after it. About... Oh, crap. Crap, crap. Say you want to discuss the weather or the price of tinsel. Anything, but... I c c can't see you anymore. I mean, outside work, I I I in a relationship. He was stumbling... I'm sorry, I, I hate to do this, I really do. I, I've had a great time with you, but... Who is she? Uh, what? She took a slug of the champagne that had just been placed in front of her, resisting the urge to ask for the bottle for pain-numbing purposes. Sixty seconds ago she couldn't see this coming, yet now she absolutely knew it was going to hurt like hell. Who is she? There's someone else. On the outside, she was calm, measured. On the inside, she was 14 and having a bigger emotional break than when she discovered that Slash from Guns N' Roses had got remarried to someone who wasn't her. I promise there isn't, Tom vowed. So he thought about it for a few seconds. Of course there wasn't such a thing as a type that cheated, but if there were, then Tom would be a founding member of the monogamy club. She'd never seen him so much as use someone else's milk from the office fridge. He was honest, decent, upstanding. So if there wasn't someone now, then it had to be... But there was. It had to be someone from his past. She'd always wondered why a guy like him had reached 30 and never married, settled down or even had a relationship that lasted longer than the one they were currently having. Or currently ending. He didn't answer. Suddenly she hated being right. An ex, she charged on. How long ago? His whole body slumped in surrender. <sighs> Twelve years ago. Twelve years? But you must have been... 
18, he replied. No, oh, come on. He was chucking her for someone he dated at a time in his life when he lived in student digs and survived on pot noodles. And you're seeing her again? No, I haven't seen her since... For God's sake, Tom, you were a kid. You can't still have real feelings for her. You're seriously dumping me for the memory of some high school girlfriend. I know it sounds crazy, but there is no but. It's completely batshit crazy. She realised that sounded harsh, so she immediately ramped it down and came back a little more conciliatory. So, did she break your heart and leave you scarred for life? No, I broke hers. Oh, for fuck's sake, she groaned. This is what I get for choosing a nice guy for once. I bloody knew it was a mistake. So go on then, tell me, how did you break her heart and why did you not fix it before now? He sighed, as if he was the one having the bad day. It's all a bit tragic and pathetic. I like tragic and pathetic, she countered. I was supposed to be having lunch with my boyfriend, but he just dumped me four days before Christmas. Right now I'm cornering the market in tragic and pathetic. That tipped him over into a space where his pity for her made him relinquish and spill the whole story. The bullet points were something like, boy meets girl, parents don't approve, they split up and boy moves to Australia, they lose touch, he comes back, can't find her, Every day since then, he regrets what he's done. Now, nine years after he left her, he's just discovered where she is, and he can't stop thinking about her. Zoe knocked back the rest of her champagne and signalled for another. This was definitely a three-glass conversation. Four glasses, when he admitted that he now felt an irrepressible need to go and see his ex, share his feelings of regret and beg her for another chance. So he thought about pointing out the folly of his ways, but could see it would be fighting a lost battle. He was torn up, conflicted, rattled. She had to let him go and get answers, and just hope that he would come back to her. She drained her glass. Then I think you need to finish it, one way or another. Otherwise you're going to live a lonely life, Tom, she said, not unkindly, and if she's married with 16 kids and has an arse the size of Govan, give me a shout. In the meantime, I'm going to go to Vivian Westwood for some consolation retail therapy. She left him with a bill, then went and shopped out her feelings. One pair of Vivian Westwood earrings later, she didn't feel any better, so she took the only reasonable, mature path. She showed up at Verity's school at 3pm, just as the final bell of the term was ringing, with two bottles of Prosecco and a Yule log, and she begged her to go and drown her sorrows with her. When it came to her choice of sister, she was hedging her bets. Marina would undoubtedly have the kids, and as for Evie, with her crazy shift patterns at the hospital, there was a better-than-average chance she'd be working. Verity was definitely the best option, given that she had a social life of monastic levels. I'd rather read a book, or wash my hair, or rearrange my knicker drawer, she'd say when they were teenagers, and Zoe was trying to drag her out to a club. Wild social abandon and spur-of-the-moment parties had never been Verity's thing. In fifth year, she'd required at least a week's warning if any guy wanted to kiss her under the mistletoe at the school disco, and even then she'd bailed out early because she said her boob tube was giving her friction rash under her arm. Zoe, on the other hand, would walk on heels until her feet bled, wear jeans that cut off circulation to her lower limbs, and a ponytail so high and tight it gave her a migraine for the sake of looking great and snagging some bloke she had her eye on. True to form, Miss Stanton, Primary 3 teacher and Best Behaved Sister of the Year nominee, didn't capitulate easily, which, admittedly, put Zoe's hackles up. It's not as if Miss Uptight had anything else planned, However, she was a chucked woman on a mission, standing in the middle of a school staff room, surrounded by snowman pictures made out of cotton wool and buttons, and she didn't give up easily. It took some persuading 
a whole lot of pleading and a fair amount of emotional blackmail, but eventually Verity agreed. Much, much later, Zoe would look back and think that if only Verity had said no, then she wouldn't be sending back the wedding presents. Chapter 3 Verity, 18 months before Miss Danton, the Virgin Mary's skirt is tucked into her knickers. Verity had never wanted a day to be over more. The nativity play was on its second run of the day and so far they'd had three sobbing sheep, a wise man who punched the innkeeper because he claimed he stole his playtime watsits, Joseph had dropped the baby Jesus twice and now Mary was having a wardrobe malfunction. Thankfully, Crystal McNamee, a.k.a. the Virgin Mary, heard the comment and swiftly modified her robes. Thirty-five minutes, came a voice just behind Verity's left ear as she stood at the side of the stage, praying her class of eight-year-olds would nail the first verse of Away in a Manger. The questionable high notes had compelled an elderly gent to take his hearing aid out at the morning performance. Probably just as well. No matter how much he drilled the correct words into them, a confused few were still singing that the baby Jesus had no crisps for his bed. Behind her, she could still feel the presence of her colleague. Was she imagining it, or could she feel his breath on the back of her neck? And should she really be contemplating how sexy that voice was when she was in close proximity to several biblical characters and the local vicar, who was sitting in the front row with the other invited guests? Sorry, I couldn't hear you over the sound of Away in a Manger. His face came within inches of hers. It wasn't an unpleasant sensation. In fact, it was the closest she'd come to an intimate encounter in longer than she chose to remember. When she'd been working with the kids on writing letters to the House of Claws, she'd been tempted to write her own. Dear Santa, please bring me a love interest for Christmas. I've been way, way too good. And not that I want to appear too demanding, but if I can specify the aforementioned love interest, please make it Ned Merton, my fellow teacher. He of the River Island model looks and the husky voice. Thank you. Her attraction to Ned Merton had sparked on the first day she met him when he joined the school a few years before. In the last year or so, though, it had grown to almost fantasy proportions, despite the fact that she'd heard rumours that he'd dated at least three of the other teachers and one of the office secretaries. Not that the women in question had confided in Verity. She had no interest in personal chat or joining the cliques in the staff room. She preferred to go in, do her job and leave. Anyway, none of the alleged relationships had lasted, so if the gossip was true, and it probably wasn't, given that the staff room was worse than the playground for exaggerated tales, then all it meant was that they hadn't been right for each other. No harm in that, was there? Now his husky voice was whispering in her ear. Thirty-five minutes, and then we're out of here for three whole weeks. I'm counting the minutes. Me too. That was true, but while she was fairly sure that Ned Merton was counting down to some kind of post-term revelry, she was staring down a night of gift wrapping, card writing, and perhaps, if she felt really wild, a bit of ironing, and then a five-mile run before bed, alone. A few of us are heading out after work today. Fancy coming along? Just into town for a few beers, something to eat, and a general rant about how we're overworked and underpaid. She shouldn't. She absolutely should not. She had things to do, gifts to wrap, cards to write, trainers to pull on, and she'd rather be tied to a tree with tinsel and starved than socialise with the rest of the people she worked with. But this was Ned Merton. And she did concede that somewhere in her mind, although not in a weirdo, stalkerish way, she'd replaced the whole nativity scene characters with her, him, a non-virgin birth, and the inclusion of a comfy room at the Holiday Inn. Did he feel it too? Dear Santa, P.S. 
Can I also have some joie de vivre and a more carefree attitude? Thank you. Kiss. Sod it. Why not? Sure. That would be great. A general murmur in the audience distracted her from his reaction. Then a giggle that escalated and spread and... Oh, dear God. The baby Jesus had now been propped up in a corner and told to watch TV while Mary and Joseph wandered off the other side of the stage, claiming they were going for a snack. You can take your eye off a religious tradition for two seconds and suddenly a biblical couple are up on child neglect charges. Verity swooped round behind the curtain to the opposite side of the stage, ambushed Mary and Joseph and ushered them back into the spotlight to more hilarity from the audience, which would have been highly mortifying if it weren't for catching Ned Merton's eye and being rewarded with a wink and an empathetic grin. Half an hour later, play over, bell rung, kids dispatched, Verity boxed up the day's Christmas swag. There had been an article in the Daily Mail about how pupils' parents were trying to outdo each other with Christmas gifts for their little darlings' teachers, splashing out on Prada purses and Chanel perfumes. Not around here. She bundled up approximately 15 boxes of roses and Quality Street, five supermarket-scented candles, six bottles of wine and a body shop gift set that had definitely been sitting in someone's bathroom cupboard since the 90s. Not that she'd become a teacher for the material rewards. Her career choice had been down to a real desire to pass on knowledge. The real desire for Ned Merton came later. Hands full, she tapped the staff room door with her foot, and as it swung open, she jolted, then flushed, as a grinning Ned held it for her to pass through. For a split second, her spirit soared, and she was sure for the first time that this wasn't a one-way thing. Was he attracted to her too? Why else would he be smiling from ear to ear? Why would he look so happy to see her? Why would those gorgeous eyes be twinkling with merriment? It had to be... Zoe? Her sister. Half leaning, half sitting on the window ledge, a bottle of wine in one hand and a mug in the other. Going by the flush of her cheeks and her slightly swaying frame, Verity guessed it wasn't the first. What are you doing here? I've come to take you out for a Christmas drink, Zoe chirped, as if this was the most normal thing ever. Verity counted up in her head the number of times they had been for a Christmas drink, or in fact, any post-work drink, and it amounted to precisely zero. But why? She caught Ned's flinch of surprise at her reaction and immediately reminded herself to adjust her tone, understanding that short and snippy probably wasn't the usual reaction when your sister pitched up and announced she wanted to take you out. Zoe didn't let it dissuade her from the cause. This wasn't a surprise. Zoe hadn't let anyone get in her way since she was six years old. She held up her wrist to her face so that she could peer at her watch face. Because, as of, uh, two hours ago, I'm officially single, and I've nominated you to be the person who comes with me to several bars, listens to me ranting, and tells me he's a complete bastard who didn't deserve me anyway. Verity's reaction was instinctive and admittedly poorly thought through, it's over with Tom. You're kidding. He's so lovely. Zoe rolled her eyes in disgust. I don't think you're getting the hang of the whole tell me he's a bastard thing. Sorry. Verity took a short pause to think. Buggery bollocks. This was what happened when it finally looked like she might finally be jump-starting her dead love life. A sister in a crisis just pulled out the plug. Why couldn't Zoe have got dumped on any other day? Did it really have to be the very afternoon that Ned Merton had asked her out? Okay, so not strictly asked her out on a fully-fledged date, but that was just semantics. Now she was in a no-win situation. Say yes, and she blew her opportunity to get to know him. Say no, and she'd look like a heartless cow and he'd probably avoid her forevermore. And that lot in the manger thought they had problems. The thing is, 
we were actually already planning to go out tonight, and... She flicked a glance at Ned, who immediately put his hands up. Don't worry about that. This is an emergency situation that clearly trumps post-term celebrations. Zoe's face lit up. Noah's perfect. A celebration sounds like a much better idea. I've got at least a week and a half for self-pity and better recrimination, so I'll start tomorrow instead. As long as you don't mind me tagging along with you tonight. Her hopeful face was completely irresistible. Except to Verity, who did her very best to resist it. Well, the thing is, it's just the teachers and... She was immediately drowned out by Ned. Of course we don't mind. It'll be great to have you with us. It'll stop us talking shop all night. Good plan. Right. I'm just going to grab a quick shower, then I'll be right with you. Off he tottered to the male locker room next door, leaving Zoe looking decidedly apologetic. Sorry, I feel like I've completely hijacked your night. You have, but it's fine. It was just a few drinks anyway. Good. So, not a date then? There was a hint of a tease in there that Verity chose to overlook. She shook her head. No, not at all. Years of experience had taught her to keep everything to herself. The minute you told one sister that you wanted something, everyone was in on the act, and they either teased you, took it from you, or added so much drama it became an ongoing miniseries. She hadn't seen her pogo stick since it mysteriously disappeared from her room in 1996, and she was fairly sure Zoe, ever the businesswoman even then, had flogged it to buy a space hopper. Of course, the acquisition of a sister's possessions had never progressed to boyfriends, but Verity wasn't up for testing the theory. Zoe took a swig from her wine mug, then grinned. Good, because you know that old adage about the best way to get over someone? I think I just found the perfect candidate for my rebound guy, at least for tonight. Verity felt six boxes of Quality Street simultaneously begin to tremble in her arms. Seriously? It had taken years to get to the going out for a drink stage with Ned Merton, and Zoe wasn't swooping in and claiming him. Oh, I think he's um, in a relationship with someone. Look, why don't you and I just head out now? Just the two of us. We were going out with a few of the other teachers, and they'll bore you to death anyway. I'll let you cry on my shoulder all night, and I won't complain once. <laughs> as long as there's alcohol involved, I'm in. Although, Ted... Ned, Verity corrected her, bristling. Ned, another swig of wine, would have been a lovely distraction. Sorry, I'm objectifying him and I know that's wrong, Miss Political Correctness 2018. Great, so now she was getting teased. Still, at least it beat Miss Stick Up Her Arse 2012 to 2018, which had been her previous moniker within the family. Why, oh why, was this happening to her? Why couldn't Zoe have crashed Marina or Evie's nights? But, in my defence, I just got chucked. Did I mention that? You did. So tonight I'm having a night off from being a grown-up. I may even objectify several members of the opposite sex, so you might want to get a pair of your muffs on. Verity's teeth clamped tight to stop her biting back. It never changed. She was a grown woman. She had a professional career. She owned a house, a car, and made healthy contributions to her pension. Yet, in the presence of an irritating sister, she still had occasional urges to thump her with a pillow and then go complaining to their mother about how Zoe was being a cow trying to steal her stuff and it wasn't fair. I can handle it. Come on, grab this stuff and help me out to the car. As long as I can take the wine... Zoe nodded to the box of bottles at Verity's feet, and I can't guarantee it'll all make it home safely. Verity shrugged. It would be a small price to pay to get her out of here and away from Ned Merton. And as for her crush, there was always next year. Or perhaps she could call him over the Christmas holidays. No, not call. A text. Yeah, that would be easier. 
she could come up with some work pretext and then maybe suggest they meet up somewhere that wouldn't be spoiled by interference by anyone else, especially someone who came from the same womb. She watched Zoe drain her mug, then put it down on the windowsill. She swallowed the urge to complain that it would leave a ring on the wood and insist that her sister wash it and put it on the drainer. No time. Let's go, vacate the area, abort Mission Ned. They were almost at the door when it opened. Ned's delight was obvious. Great, you're ready. I've texted the others and told them we wouldn't make it. They're just down in some pub near here anyway. Thought we could head into the city, make a night of it. Verity's heart sank. She hated city centre bars. She hated the noise, the chaos, the prices, total rip-off. Although she'd have been more than happy to endure it if it was just her and Ned in a cosy corner for two. Not three. A man after my own heart? Zoe was agreeing. Damn. Now if she refused, she'd look like... Like... Yep, Miss Stick Up The Arse. 2012 to 2018. New plan. She'd go along with it and hope that Zoe had such a head start in the vino sticks that she was in a taxi and on the way home before seven o'clock. Then she and Ned could go out for dinner, perhaps somewhere quiet, somewhere they could really talk and get to know each other better. Then she might even invite him back to her house. She kept it spotless so she never had to worry about unexpected guests. Not that she ever had any, she much preferred life to be organised in advance. That thought gave her a glimmer of hope that it might just work out after all. Here, let me get that, Ned was saying now as he took a box containing six bottles of wine from Zoe's arms. Verity, do you need me to grab anything else? Me, was her first thought, but she kept that to herself. There was plenty of time to work on that tonight. Much as she loved her sister and would give her the world, there were limits. She had been prepared to let the pogo stick go, but Ned Merton? Heartbroken or not, her sister wasn't taking him too. Chapter 4 Evie, 18 months before Evie was hanging a large gold ball on one of the slightly threadbare tree branches when a scene in the corner of the day room caught her eye. Babs, back away from the target. Take a hint, my love. Babs, all 79 years of her, rolled her eyes, breaking her expectant stare at Cedric, who was trying his best to pretend he was reading a two-day-old newspaper, which he was holding up in a strategic position between their faces. Conceding defeat, Babs pushed her Zimmer in Evie's direction, then lowered herself into an armchair and tossed a branch of mistletoe over the shoulder of her bright red jumper, emblazoned with the words, Gangsta Rapper. Bloody useless stuff. I remember when it meant something. You could have a year-long drought, but as soon as the mistletoe came out, the lip action was on. Can't be using that nowadays, Babs. You'll end up on a watch list. The mistletoe prowler, armed with a small branch and a wave of nostalgia. Despite her malcontent with the modern world, Babs let out a cackle of laughter. At least it'll be more bloody interesting than this place. I'll give you next month's pension if you break me out of here. Evie dangled a flashing snowman from another branch. Can't. I'd miss you too much. And so would Cedric. Avoiding you has given him a real purpose to his days here. You're great for getting his activity levels up. Bab snorted out another cackle. That was the thing about Evie's favourite patient. She could dish out the banter, but she loved it when someone came right back at her. Evie reached up to place the last reindeer on a high branch. The tree had originally been put up on the 1st of December, but the lovely Mr Dawson, rheumatoid arthritis, requested custard with every meal, had clipped it with his wheelchair and sent the whole thing crashing down behind him this morning. Restoring it had taken Evie the best part of an hour after she'd finished her shift, but it was worth it. 
It gave the patients and their families a little bit of normality at what was invariably a difficult time. Ward 54 was the long-term geriatric ward at Glasgow Central, and Evie had worked there since she'd qualified eight years ago. Other friends in the profession had moved around, tried out different fields, but from the moment she'd started her rotation in geriatrics, she knew it was where she belonged. Of course this specialty brought heartbreak, nursing so many patients in the final chapters of their lives, but nothing else had come close to the enjoyment and fulfilment she got from working with people who were around long before internet and smartphones, who had stories to tell, lives to recount, and who, in the case of Babs and the many others like her, were still determined to make every day count. Right, Babs, that's me off for the night. I'll see you in the morning. Not if I manage to escape during the night. I just need to think of a way to distract the bouncers. With that, she gestured to the window that separated the day room from the corridor, where the senior charge nurse, Kay Gorman, was marching from one end of the ward to the other. There's a woman that could haunt a house, Bab said archly, her Glaswegian brogue thick with disapproval. Evie did her best to hide her amusement with a professional attitude. Kay was her best mate, but she conceded that she did give off a slightly stern aura. Underneath, she was pure mush, though. I'll pass your comments on to Charge Nurse Gorman. She couldn't keep up the formality. You know, in case she's looking for a new hobby, house haunting might work. Bab's chuckles were still ringing in her ears as she headed out into the corridor and down past the nursing station. What set Babs off this time? Kay asked, an amused glint in her eye. <laughs> Mistletoe, don't ask. Is she still calling me a torn-faced old boot? Or was that just yesterday's slight? Nope, she's got you haunting houses now. Excellent. I think that means I must be grown on her. Anyway, are you still okay for tomorrow? Absolutely. It was their only day off together all month, and they'd planned shopping, eating, drinking and general Christmas merriment before Evie clocked back on for five days straight. Evie always worked double shifts Christmas Eve, the 6am to noon shift on Christmas morning, then double shifts on Boxing Day and the day after to let the staff with young families, Kay included, have as much time off as possible. It suited Evie perfectly as it meant she got to spend Christmas morning with her patients, then make it in time to Marina's for the family lunch. What plans are you two hatching now, then? Evie felt herself jump at the sound of the voice behind her. Why? Why, bloody why, did Dr Seth McGonagall have this effect on her? Just the mere appearance of him made her feel flustered and judged, and she wasn't sure why. Her only theory was that her buttons were pressed by the cool, accomplished perfection of him. Not that she found him attractive, Definitely not. There was a long list of reasons that he absolutely wasn't her type. Number one, he was very much married to a very aloof, perfectly formed cardio surgeon who worked out of the fourth floor. Number two, he was a health-obsessed exercise freak who cycled to work every day and made herself conscious because she'd forgotten to go to the gym for approximately 654 days in a row. Number three, in the two and a half years that he'd been the consulting orthopaedic specialist on this floor, he had been all brusqueness and barely offered a single moment of friendliness. And number four, not sure yet, but it involves shopping cake and it will probably end in a karaoke bar with me murdered in last Christmas. Number four, she always blurted out nonsense when she was in his presence. Again, why? Bloody why? Since the first moment he'd crossed the threshold into their ward, rubbing sanitizer into his hands as he strode purposefully towards the nursing station, he'd caused some kind of chemical reaction in her brain that proved that when intelligence was mixed with professional decorum and Seth McGonagall, the result was a mortifying explosion of verbal diarrhoea. He took a moment to digest the karaoke comment before he shrugged, muttered a clearly unimpressed, 
whatever floats your boat, and sauntered off. Evie's head thudded down onto the top of the nursing station, while Kay giggled. You tit! You're trying to impress him with wham songs. Don't say another word. Evie stopped her, then picked up her bag and gave Kay a doleful kiss on the cheek. I just don't get why you can't smile and be friendly. And I'm not trying to impress him, I was just being nice. Even so, I can't believe I said that. I'm away home to wallow in my shame and incompetence in private. Are you sure you don't fancy him maybe just a little? Kay asked sceptically. Because, you know, he's cute and fit and smart. With only one major potential character flaw. Which is? Evie asked, even though she really, really didn't want to. He might not know the words to last Christmas. Evie paused. I need a new friend, she said archly, and took off, trying not to giggle despite Kay's laughter following her all the way down the corridor to the exit. The car park was deserted, and so were the roads. Eight o'clock at night on the Friday before Christmas clearly wasn't prime driving time. Only twenty minutes later she was turning the key to her flat in the south side suburb of Busby. Evie often thought it would be easier to move nearer to work, but then she came home to her lovely little flat overlooking the river, and all thoughts of moving evaporated. In her bedroom, she took off her clothes and dropped them in the laundry basket, pulled on a onesie, fur leopard print, and brushed her teeth. She'd once read that brushing the teeth reprogrammed the mind and made it less likely that you'd overeat afterwards. Final rinse completed, she contemplated the fact that she still did it, even though she knew it was a load of bollocks, all the way to the fridge in the kitchen. Okay, pre-prepared salad, made the night before from a Weight Watchers recipe, chicken breast with wholemeal rice, slimming world, two chicken breasts, keto, or maybe she should just shut the door and stick to the intermittent fasting plan she decided on when she woke up that morning. Her stomach rumbled the answer. She was tired. She'd worked a 12-hour shift and then stayed behind afterwards to redo the tree. It was the Friday before Christmas, and she was at home alone at nine o'clock at night, while the rest of the world was getting into the festive spirit. Sod it. She deserved to be nice to herself. The chicken and sweet corn pizza was out of the freezer and in the oven before she could stop herself. At least the sweet corn had to count as one of her five a day. Oh, and take that, minty fresh breath. Two opposite waves of feeling squared up against each other in her gut. Delight and anticipation held hands on one side, knowing they were about to be comforted by the giddy delight from Chicago town, while a knot of disappointment gathered speed as it twisted up to tornado level. Seriously? Where the hell was her willpower, her discipline, her self-pride? The ticking hands of the clock above the oven door were a welcome distraction as she spotted they were counting down to ten seconds, to nine, eight seconds, five seconds, three seconds, one. Her phone rang, right on schedule. It wasn't even necessary to look at the screen. Hi, Mum. She answered. How are you doing? I'm leaving him, Evie. I've made up my mind this time. Sighing, Evie opened the fridge again, took out a bottle of Prosecco and, cradling the phone under her ear, popped the cork and poured a large glass. Again, sod it. It was empty calories, but it was worth it to get through what would undoubtedly be at least 20 minutes of her mother discussing plans to leave her husband. Poor Derek. Husband number three, and it was beginning to look like he was going to join her second husband, divorced 2008, in the Marge Danton Walton Morrison world of past tense. Evie felt her skin prickle as she thought about the first person who belonged on that list. It was twenty years this month since their father, Will Danton, had left. There in the morning, gone by nightfall, deserting them before Evie even made it to her teenage years. 
The shock of the cold wine hitting her stomach snapped her from the memory and halted the emotional train that was plummeting downwards. Back to the call. Why, Mum? She should have said, Why today? Or why this week? The threat was frequent and consistent. Only the reasons changed. Because what's the point? Seriously, what is the point? Marge wailed. Decision time. Make some urgent excuse and cut it short, or commit to what would undoubtedly be a long, agitated ramble, which would include several self-help quotes and at least one reference to Oprah Winfrey. Reluctantly, but with an air of resignation, Evie took her phone from her ear, switched it onto speaker, and placed it on the counter. Only when she was braced, prepared, and had her wine back in her hand, did she give the cue to open the floodgates. The point of what, Mum? Of staying when he doesn't nourish my soul. He just wants to give up, to sail into old age. I'm fifty bloody three, not eighty-three. I need more in my life, Evie. I know you do, Mum. Her very best sympathetic tone. Drawer open, plate out, another drawer, pizza cutter, a pang of guilt. Solution, open fridge again, retrieve salad and decide to only eat half the pizza and to have salad with it. Another one of her five a day. You know, Oprah says we all have to live in our truth. Hell no. Fridge open again, salad back in. This was a whole pizza kind of night. The timer on the oven dinged just as her mum was winding up the conversation. So, I'm going to suggest he comes to yoga with me in the new year. I feel it's his last chance to make an effort. Good idea, mum. Pizza cutter in action. Six slices in seconds. Glance at the phone screen. Nineteen minutes her mum had been on for. Pretty much standard. Anyway, I'd better go, Evie. I want to get some reading in before Graham Norton comes on. Keeps the mind active. Okay, mum. Wait for it. Here it comes. Right then. How are you anyway, pet? There it was. The question to which the only desired answer was... I'm fine, Mum. Lovely. Right. I'll talk to you tomorrow then. Cheerio. Click. Evie carried her plate and wine glass through to the living room and plumped down on the sofa before flicking a few buttons on the remote control. What was she in the mood for? She consulted her sky planner and went for Grey's Anatomy. There was nothing in this world that couldn't be solved by an interlude with Amelia Shepherd, Meredith Grey's flawed, spiky, funny and unpredictable sister. In her mind they were kindred spirits, minus the alcohol addiction, Amelia's, the trail of gorgeous lovers, Amelia's, the size eight jeans, Amelia's, and the large chicken and sweet corn pizza. Evie's. The first bite of pizza had barely been taken when the phone rang again. Verity. Sigh. Answer. She could hear what sounded like music and revelry in the background. Hey, lovely. What's up? Evie answered.